Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth program. I am Cheryl Evans Davis, Executive Director of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission and your moderator for today. The club would like to thank the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event. It is absolutely my pleasure to introduce April Ryan, award-winning journalist and author of Black Women Will Save the World, an anthem. April was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, and graduated from Morgan State University. For over 25 years, April has been one of the few Black female reporters covering the White House and five presidential administrations. She is currently a political analyst for CNN and Washington, D.C. bureau chief for the GRIO. Not only does April work tirelessly to report the truth, but she continues to give back as a mentor to aspiring journalists and assisting with developing up and coming broadcasters. April, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Um, I'm so excited to be in space with you and, and really grateful for the opportunity to talk about the book. Um, well, thank, you, thank you. It's so wonderful to be with you. Last time I was with the Commonwealth Club, I was in person it's your beautiful space. And um, prayerfully next time, next yeah. week, we can be back in, in yeah. person in that beautiful space again. Oh, I know. I would love to be in person with you. First off, to get the book signed, because I have to tell you, the book was like therapy for me. Was I, it? It was, it was like a therapy session. Like so at many the people, end. As so many people are connecting to it. And um, I'm just, and it's not just Black women. It's black men, it's white men, it's white women, it's people, people from all walks of life who just want to get more of an understanding of the brilliance, the resilience, the overcoming in spite of of black women. Because, you know, we, we, we celebrate everyone, but it's our time to celebrate ourselves. Well, I think that's part of why it was so therapeutic for me. Like there are so many pieces, so many nuggets in there, but you you elevate like I, I'm I know I've not enough time for me to go through page by page everything that I like highlighted and put a heart next to or a star. But the first piece, the first piece for me, the first question is, is, you know, you have these three sections in the book and you talk about um, the impact of folks, the impact of black women. Yeah. And one part, it, you, you talk about these three sections. And so I wanted to ask more about like, how did you choose those three areas to highlight this piece around experience, the, the cost of being the oh. black woman and um, the future? And, and let me tell you, the future just gives me hope. But, but those three spaces, how do you I, outline that? You know, I wanted to celebrate black women and we had to not just say, OK, this is a celebration. We had to come and really do our research. <sighs> oh, my gosh. If you only knew the psychological pieces that we studied, um, you know, because it, it almost became uh, a school education psychology book uh, for a college student. But we, we took a lot of that out, but left the basis. But there's still a lot of stats in there. But we wanted people to really understand that there are real complexities to being a black woman in America, starting from a wee child to this moment. And it's not just starting from a wee child to this moment, but it's dating all the way back to slavery, the truth of slavery um, and why we stand, how we stand. We stand in spite of, we rise. Um, and it's not just a Maya Angelou poem and wow. still we rise. It's not just words of a poem that Ketanji Brown Jackson spoke of Maya Angelou's poem. This is just the truth intrinsically of who we are. And we had to really do a breakdown because this has been long in coming and I wanted people to really get the understanding of who black women are, um, the resilience why, um, who we have been, the cost, the cost is so important and in the future. I cried, Cheryl, when I, um, 
did the audio book for the future. I wrote it, but when I had to read it, I cried because I am a divorced mother of two young black women, aspiring women. And I talk about adultification in the book mm -hmm. and it just made me, it brought me to tears. You write something and then you say, oh, this is great, but then you read it. And then I got emotional mm -hmm. um, in my audio book towards it. And people say it's so compelling, but that, that book took me every, it took me on a journey. I was like, I felt like I was in a Pentecostal church. I had to <laughs> just go through, you know? Yeah. And, but the future, because I see my children who are aspiring queens, you know, I call myself the queen of the house. Um, and I call them Princess Ryan, Princess Grace, but they are aspiring queens as well and aspiring women, young women. And what's black, aspiring young black women and the obstacles that have been put in their space. And then also me as a divorced mom, you know, wanting to make sure that they've had a childhood and enjoyed and not just been, you know, dealing with things um, in a more mature way because it's just the three of us. So I had to check myself you know, in this moment, as I'm raising two aspiring young black women who are con already contributing members of the society. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the you talking because I reread the, the last pages this morning and I was like, girl, stop crying because it just it is so powerful. Doesn't it? It takes you there. And I'm and I hate to say this as the author, but it's like because I had to go back. I had to really do. I wrote it. I was like, oh, when you write, it's like, oh, yeah, you got to put this part in. You got to say this. And then you put it together and then you, you let it breathe. You let it marinate. You go through the reread. But then when you're doing the audio book and you're putting the emotion behind it and you're speaking, it comes out and it comes out in the reading. Um, it's we don't you know, I'm not going to give you any spoiler alerts because we want you to read the book because it's that important and it's that powerful. No, I, I agree. I was just like, this is this is I'm like, I have to have you back in San Francisco to be in person because it's so powerful. But there are a couple things that you mentioned that really resonated with me. First, the research, like, you know, the the number of women that you outline and highlight and that you celebrate. I was like, you, you talk about um just the the price. I'm like, how much time did you spend in this? Because the names, the the things that you point out, there are some things that I that I've only heard a few people talk about over the years, and you highlight those things. And how much time did you spend on research and like pouring through to get this data that you put in here? We spent a lot of time. I have a team, and we spent a lot of time researching. And you know, it was it was so crazy because. I said, okay, these are the women I want to talk to. A lot of the women I wanted to talk to, I couldn't, but the, it was supposed to be this way with the women that I talked to. And all of the women I wanted to talk to were in this book. But when they spoke of different issues, to run back and say, okay, let's do this. And this goes along with this, this conversation here and this, it all fell into place. Um, we researched, we, scratched our heads. We were told by the editor, okay, now this is not uh, an academic book, guys. Because we just, I mean, we went in. Um, we were pulling out professors and things. I mean, like for instance, um, Bell Hooks, Massage Noir, right? Mm -hmm. um, Bell Hooks, who spells her name with lowercase b and h. Um, Massage Noir. But if you really want to go back in 1972 or maybe beyond with Shirley Chisholm, her depiction of Massage Noir was being black and a woman was a double whammy. Massage Noir is just the fact that you're black and a woman and what you're up against in this nation. We researched that. We researched adultification. We researched the fact that there's so many black women, the numbers of black women who are missing in this country. When we talk about when we have these Joy Reid did it on her show talking about, um, you know, women, you know, white women who are missing. But there are scores of black women who are missing and never have a, uh, a wanted sign or, or missing picture uh, posted for them. And there's somebody's child, somebody's mother, somebody's sister. There's somebody in this nation who's not been counted and there's no accountability for 
So we we just kept going. And um, it was important to document this, um, even if we took out some of the stats, but we left a lot in, a lot in for you to chew on and take in and just drink in to digest. A lot of people said, you know, I left thinking. That's what you need to do. Think. Because there is a drastic difference, yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say you totally humanize the data, right? So often we get these statistics and, and it's easy for people to look them over. But I think you really took the data and and made it so that it resonates with people and doesn't just become more numbers and figures. Putting a face and a story behind it makes it real. It's almost like Emmett Till. And if, for those of you who've seen the Till movie, you know, we all saw that picture, you know, back in 1955. This tortured child. This child who was burned, who was being thrown in the river, who became, according to, with the words in the movie, puffy and spoiled. The picture of him in his casket really was one of those move, uh, moments that created the movement of civil rights. We've heard about it. You know, the Black press has been beating the drum about it. Mm -hmm. but you actually saw it mm -hmm. in that picture. You saw it. Mm -hmm. It was made real. We were in horror. The nation watched. The world watched. We were in horror. This mother who was grieving, this Black woman who was grieving, who wanted justice for her son. And then now watching the movie, it's just like the movie with my book, the words become larger than life. We see a person. We see humanity. It brings humanity to some of these stories of pain, hurt, and overcoming. And that's, you know, I, I'm equating it to that movie, you know, that single picture, that one dimensional picture became life with the movie. We humanized Emmett Till and his mother, uh, Mamie Till Mobley, but also in this book, we humanized Stacey Abrams. She's not just a news story. She's right. not just the lady who, who ran for governor twice and lost. She's not just the lady who won by changing that blood red state blue. We talk about Keisha Lance Bottoms. You know, we hear, we laugh. You know, I like to say Atlanta had a man named Keisha, but you know, <laughs> we talk like that. But she's a human being who is a dynamic woman who's led one of the largest economies in this nation, who saved the, the nomination, not the nomination, but saved the candidacy of then candidate Joe Biden to run for office. And she saved him yet again. When his poll numbers dropped, she went into the administration. Valerie Jarrett, for all intents and purposes, Valerie Jarrett and Michelle Obama created the first black president of the United States of America. And in this, and 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 Cheryl, you this part really, you know, Valerie's my friend. And when she shows up for me, she shows up because I didn't expect her to say this. She talks about imposter syndrome. Mm. This woman who, for all intents and purposes, was the reason why Barack Obama was president of the United States. She says sometimes when she sits at those tables to make decisions that impact all of us. She felt like an imposter. Why? Because of the ghosts and the haunts of the past. This brings texture, understanding, and a three-dimensional humanness to the people that you see in the news or in the newspaper or when you do a Google search. Yeah. Well, you, you know, there's so much there that I want to impact. First and foremost, like you talk about um, you, you made the reference to Emmett Teal and humanizing that data. Right. So, you know, you mentioned even in the book, Walter White and all the work that he did around lynchings. But really, it was the work of Mamie Teal Mobley that humanized that work. And I feel like it ignited the conversation, which is what you say you hope this book will do. And I feel right. like the listing of the names and the calling out of the people will ignite the conversations that you are seeking. Exactly. exactly. And, and in the black press, we have been, and, and, and not just the black press, we have a, we do, or we have a lot of, a, a large oral tradition in, in our community from slavery on up. We've been beating the drums about this has been happening, you know, from, from, uh, sheriffing of slaves till now about lynching and, and, and things that happened. I mean, you know, can you say Ahmaud Aubrey? That was a lynching. 
And it took hundreds of years for there to be an anti-lynching law on the books. And now, what is it, 67 years later, this year we have the Emmett Till anti-lynching law on the books stemming from what happened 55 years ago. But this has been going over and over and over again for hundreds of years. So, and, and this is one of the reasons too why I get so upset when people say, oh, that's not true. Uh-uh. Mm. You can, I cannot refute and deny the truth um, that is in this community and still we rise nonetheless in spite of. Yeah, and, and that, that attention and the call out to that where we know it anecdotally, but where you spell it out with the names and the the examples of folks. Um, I think about uh, your your conversations with Mayor Lightfoot and the reference yeah. around the power of sisterhood or the sister yeah. mayors and being here in San Francisco and knowing and having worked with London Breed. Yes, your mayor. Yes, our mayor. And just knowing that gave you a little bit of nugget, right? Oh, I mean, my gosh. All these black women, and I was in, uh, when I, I came to San Francisco, I love San Francisco and Oakland. One of my favorite jewelers happens to be uh, Dorian Webb out in um, San Francisco. Okay. So, um, but nonetheless, I was there. Um, Frederica Newton was there. I was, I met um, your mayor. I mean, it's so amazing. And, and the, the mayor of New Orleans, the mayor mm -hmm. of DC, Lakeisha Lance Bottoms was mayor. There is, that is rarefied air. Okay. One to be a mayor, one to be any kind of elected official, but then to be mayor of a major metropolitan city and then to have the issues and then to be a black woman. You don't have many people who look like you and can speak like you in this moment. So what uh, Chicago's mayor, Lori, Light, Lori Lightfoot, who's had, a lot of battles, all of these black women mayors have had some of their battles. What they do is come together. There's a sisterhood, there's a commonality, they come together and they speak to one another to breathe life into each other when you're beaten down by just fighting for your city. Mm -hmm. And the the just just the openness of mayor life, and it's a mayor life, but I was doing an interview for the Rio. I said, can I put this in my book? She said, sure. And she is the first one. I'm on Twitter and I put her thing up. She said, you're damn right. It is, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, this is a very rarefied space. I mean, she was like, she is unapologetically her and she stands with those women. She couldn't tell me how they talk or when they talk, but they talk. Mm -hmm. And when one is going through a test, meaning they're going through something, the, the black female sisterhood mayors get together where well, I've been through it. This is what I did. And, and they come together for the betterment of each other, but yet that betterment goes towards bettering the community that they're serving. Yeah. And let's talk about this too, Cheryl. In the book, when black women serve, particularly in politics, Cornell Belcher, brilliant corner said, it's about community and love, mm -hmm. uplift, versus our male counterparts, a lot of times about and power and ego. So there is something there. Um, yeah. No, I, I was just, so I was fortunate to travel um, to Essence this year with Mayor Breed and be in space with her and Mayor Cantrell. And it is like you, you, what you describe is exactly what I have witnessed, but the yeah. same piece around the story that you say is, and that you've woven so beautifully through this, through the book, this idea that whether you are the mayor or a domestic worker, the ability to be dismissed. I think about the work that um, that has happened where if the mayor hadn't vouched for me, that work would have been erased. But I look at the work that this black woman mayor has done that has not been celebrated on a national and sometimes not even a local level. And, and all I can surmise is because she's a black woman. And it's so interesting. I'm so glad you brought up Essence because that's where I run into a lot of these powerful black women. Kamala Harris was at Essence. We yeah. saw that. You know, she was at Essence this last year. I was there to do a panel on with Higher Heights on women and how about the book. And I was also there. I saw um, my daughter saw Janet Jackson and I definitely saw New Edition and the Isley Brothers. But, <laughs> you know, but, you know, that, that comes along with it. But 
it's so interesting. You know, I met Stacey Abrams for the first time at the Essence Festival. Mm. I met Mayor Cantrell at the Essence Festival. And when we, those, those women's organizations, there's power in these organizations and in these, these, these events because they want to show up. It's about a sisterhood. The Essence Festival is about the family and community. The Essence is focused in on black women. And for these women to recognize that, that sisterhood and to speak to the other women, it gives information, it gives power, it gives hope. And that's, that's just amazing. And, and how we all circle around, look, you and human rights in San Francisco, me and my Baltimore DC connection going down there, you know, for news, mm -hmm. the mayors, this is the power of sisterhood mm -hmm. and community that I speak about in this book. And, and you do it. Um, what I really appreciate two things off the, that I like one that I wanted to just acknowledge the language and the, the vocabulary and the way that you call things out. I was writing this list of the words that I was like, she sees me, you know, ignored, overlooked, denied, denigrated, discounted, inadequate, oh. right? Oh. Language that is, you know, that unfortunately permeates the black experience. And then the second piece was around just the highlighting of intergenerational and calling out the legacy and thinking of folks like Sojourner Truth who fought both for voting rights um, as a black woman, she got erased for her blackness and for yeah. her being a woman. Yeah, yeah, and that goes to misogynoir. It goes yeah. to double whammy, but you know, Keisha Lance Bottoms, and I want to speak to this, again, another example. The former mayor of Atlanta, who is currently in the Office of Public Engagement at the White House and the Biden administration. When she was mayor of Atlanta, the largest airport in the nation, a city that has one of the largest economies, a city that has a large number of Fortune 500 companies headquartered there that she has to deal with. She is dealing with all sorts of issues. She was a judge. Mm. Keisha Lance Bottoms has a pedigree that if you turn your eye, turn your head, close your eye, you go, like, oh, this pedigree. And then you place black woman on you, go, oh, okay. <laughs> but in her attempts to govern, and what stuck with me about being seen and, you know, in the midst of being diminished discounted, erased. She said someone, a man told her one time, oh, well, who told you that? And she was walking around making decisions for the city of Atlanta. How diminishing and disrespectful for someone to believe that she did not have the wherewithal to think for herself. Mm. Mm. That goes to the discounting of who we are, our abilities, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just, it never stops, right? Like this idea of fighting and being resilient and saving the world. And you, you, you call to attention Harriet Tubman who fought as an abolitionist, but then also fought literally in the, in the war. Right. And those stories don't get told. It gets. Right. Exactly. Um, they don't get told. And this is why it's so important for us to, tell the truth, tell the stories, give the stories, put more of a, a humanity behind the pictures that we see in the history books or on the walls in some institution. We have to give the layers of these people who they were so the next generation can fight on in any way that they can because each generation is the foundation for the next generation to stand. She was solid. She was so solid that she saved the strongest that survived and brought them north. Mm -hmm. She was so solid that we are the fruit of what she did. Think about that. Mm. We are the fruit of what she did. She took this woman, this slave, was so cunning. She took the profit off the plantation and still understanding, understanding the danger 
and the dogs and the guns and the horses and the men who were trying to find her, she kept going back. Mm -hmm. She kept going back to free slaves and send them up north for a better life of freedom. We are the fruit of that labor of Harriet Tubman. Mm. It, it just it reminds me of the the piece in the book when you talk about the travel to, to Ghana. Right. And this yeah. idea of just existing is um, is homage is homage or, uh, or honor to our ancestors. Yeah. We're not just existing. Um, you and I are not just existing. We're telling the story. Mm. Mm. Um, and the story for me is really poignant because I'm five generations removed from the last known slave in my family, Joseph Dollar Brown, who was sold on the auction block in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And Cheryl was so funny. Um, as I was writing this book, and I don't think I've ever really said this. Um, you, you got me talking about this. As I was writing this book, I felt such a kinship. Who am I? Who am I? Where am I? Who am I? Who am I? I went on, uh, what is it? One, two, three, and me. What is that? Um, oh, uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. The 23, 23, 23. Yeah, I'm like, one, two, three, and me. Yes, 23 <laughs> and me. Uh, and I got my ancestry. Um, I figured it out because you have to think about this. We keep saying, um, I'm strong, but where did I get it from? I got it from my mother who was laid back, but she had a silent, quiet strength who got it from her mother, who was strong with 14 children in the South, but still kept going. Who got it from her mother, who was strong, whose husband left her, but she kept going with her two daughters to make sure that they could be okay back in that day, okay? Mm -hmm. And then before her was her slave mother. And then I'm like, well, what, I, what happens after that? As I'm talking about these women, I'm like, well, what about me? Where, how does the strength come? I went to 23andMe, because I, I want to dig a little bit further, but I went to 23andMe and I found out, you know, I'm 86% Sub-Saharan African, mm -hmm. Scandinavian and British, the other parts. But I saw where my ancestor, my female ancestor was raped. Mm. I saw there and I cried. And if you look in my acknowledgements of forward, not forward, my acknowledgements and credits, I talk about my Angolan, my Nigerian, um, my uh, Senegalese ancestry. I didn't know, I wanted to find out, but I didn't know until this book because the strength of women, mm. and talking about the strength of women, I was like, well, where did I get mine from? And I started finding out. I still, I'm still on that journey to find out more. I'm not trying to, to connect with cousins that I right, don't know right. yet. Yeah. As you know, <laughs> my daughter is doing that. She says, oh, mommy, we've got a white cousin that's down in Dallas. I said, okay. I said, you want to talk? She said, yeah, they reached out to me. I said, okay, that's cool. I'm not ready to talk to people yet because I, I want to just, I'm trying to digest it. And a lot of these are third, fourth, fifth removed. And I don't know, they may like the fact that they have a cousin by the name of April and some of them just may not. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm not ready for that yet. But I do want to dig further, but think about this. And this is a piece that we have to understand. Why are black women so strong? Why are we known for our strength? We're so known for our strength because we're so known for our strength that it has caused people not to see us as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's caused people not to think that we hurt. You know, oh, you know, it's caused doctors to say, oh, their pain isn't that bad. You know, mm -hmm. this is fact, okay? Because I even, I even talk about some of my own personal issues. Yeah. But think about this. In slavery, in Africa, on the west coast of Africa, going back to what you originally said, when slave women were picked, when slave women were picked, they looked at their breasts, their bare breasts, 
treated like meat, right? Looked at their bare breasts to see if they were spoiled. If the breast was sagging, it showed, oh, they had had children already, so no, they're spoiled, let's throw them back. But the women who had perky breasts were the ones that they kept for the journey because they were going to be, they were going to sire, if you will, or bear the free labor. They would be studded. Mm. Human beings, mm. they would be studded to carry the free labor, the next generation of free labor. It's ugly, it's harsh, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, strongest survived that journey, that long, long journey in the bottom of a ship, on water, rocking. I'm making myself seasick just doing that right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think of that, months and months on these ships, the strongest survived. The shark pattern even changed in Africa, the, the trail from Africa to here because they, the sharks started feeding off the bodies they were throwing off the ships. Hmm. Now, when we get here, you wanna know why black women are strong because it's in our DNA, because we had to be. When we get here, they ripped our men from us. We had to stand by ourselves. Families were not families. We had to stand by ourselves. So we are strong because it's generation after generation after generation after generation. I am not glorifying standing by yourself, but if any other group can stand by themselves and make it in spite of, it's a black woman because of what history has done. Mm. So, so, so powerful. And I, I think you, you say, you talk about the need to have um, thick skin or um, I really appreciate it. Even the way that you did that just now is is really the cadence and the flow of the book. And I remember one line where you say you were born to report, but I feel like you are you are born to tell the stories, right? To to help us understand and unpack, you know that and history. That, yeah, and that's what this is. I've always been an inquisitive child. I've always wanted to know the backstory, the whys, the wins, the hows. And I used to, so funny as a kid, my aunt, my parents are gone to war, the transition is world, but my aunt says, remember when you were a kid, when Tom Jones used to be on, you used to, you used to take an extension cord, you strip down to your diaper and sing with Tom Jones. I remember singing with him. I don't remember stripping down with my diaper, but that was, I was a kid, you know, when he was singing Pussycat, Pussycat. Uh, look, I had my extension cord like it was a microphone. They said, you were destined for something. <laughs> Born to, I'm, born girl, to. I'm telling you more stuff than I've ever told anyone. Oh my God. Well, I love it. I love it. There's a question from the audience that I want to tag something. One of the questions I had for you is aligned with this. They, they say you emphasize this book is an ode to black women, which I appreciate. What do you think the most effective way each of us can better recognize and acknowledge the underappreciated work of black women? And so on top of that, April, I wanted to, I've been saying to folks, you know, black was trending, you know, during George Floyd and when people were responsive and you talk a little bit about the young people, how and he called out his mom. Okay. He mother. Okay. And so black women were trending. Was this, you know, is this, how did you find the space and time to do this when a time when, when it's not quite as trendy anymore to talk about black women? I don't care if it's trendy and that is like, <laughs> I mean, it's not, you know, I'm not a trend. I'm a human being. Yeah. And we have to speak to our hurts, our haunts, our successes. And if we don't, we won't. And we got to feel, okay. Let me tell you something. Bishop T.D. Jakes told me a long time ago when I wrote one of my books, he said, do you ever celebrate yourself? I was embarrassed to say no. I was ashamed that I give and give and give and give and give. And that's what we do. We bring everyone into the community. Baby, oh, you need this, you need that. When it comes to me, I don't know how to receive and I don't know how to celebrate myself. And I'm learning to change that through Bishop T.D. Jake saying that. And I ask, I'm in a lot of these rooms and I ask women, I said, do you know how to celebrate yourself? Few hands, I mean, I'm talking 200 people. A few hands raised. Mm -hmm. This is not um, myth, conjecture. This is real. Mm -hmm. This is fact. 
that we have to change our mindset. We are not workhorses. We have to change our mindset and, and start focusing in on ourselves and celebrating. The reason why this book, I wanted to write this book years ago. It wasn't time. Harper Collins knew that I wanted to write this. And then they said, wait a minute. When Biden and Kamala Harris came into uh, the White House, they said, wait a minute, we have something here. Then all of a sudden, in writing this book, because Biden was not expected, I talk about this in the book, <laughs> yes, yes. Biden was not expected to do all these black women. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he, he, somebody who's close to him, who I cannot name, who has his ear, said he doesn't operate like that. But there's a whole story, uh, Kamala Harris pushed him, I believe, to do more on race. Mm -hmm. um, Cause the George Floyd thing um, yeah. just really got to him and it changed. That was a transformational moment. And then Amy, uh, uh, Amy Klobuchar was like, look, you need a black woman. And it just, it, the stars lined up. But the person said to me, look, Biden is not like that. He, he promised a black woman as a Supreme Court justice. He's not going to uh, put a black woman on his ticket. I'm like, I don't know. But Kari Sellers and I were talking left, right. He's like, April, what's going to happen? I'm like, nah, because I had seen some stuff. And then it happened. So then, okay, so along the line of doing the book, then comes Kareem jean -Pierre. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> then along writing the book, a Supreme Court justice leaves. I'm like, wait a minute, okay, let's see. Hmm. Here comes another K, Katanji Brown Jackson. I said, well, dog. I said, <laughs> we have, I said, we've got this one. Black women will save the world in that thing. Mm -hmm. So it what? has been interesting. You got uh, Shalanda Young, head of office management and budget. You got Susan Rice. You got Marsha Fudge at HUD. You've got so many Black women who are lifting in this administration. It's not about the politics of this administration. It's mm -hmm. not about this president. It's about Black women who have the pedigree, not optics, but serving a country that sometimes doesn't always love them back, but they're serving because that's who we are. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, again, just the, the focus and the ability to unpack that, to talk about the humanity. I think a lot of the things you talk about in terms of vulnerability, vulnerability, the, the ability to, um, to move through, even when you know that you may or may not be the one to get, uh, the credit for it. I want to remind folks we're going to um, do Q and A shortly, so please in the chat, uh, the YouTube chat, nice put in questions, questions, please. Nice, nice questions, questions. <laughs> nice, nice questions. But that's the end of all. But nice questions, please. Well, if they're not nice, we're not going to ask them anyway. Mm -hmm. So I just want folks to know. Um, I, I was moved by your call out again of folks that have been so instrumental in the work, or even causing people to think about, like you talk about a young Ella Baker, right? Like you you draw that attention and you make the connection where some folks may not even realize that she, the work that she did or the impact she had on NAACP, right? Like this idea, of even for this next generation, for us to stop and listen, to pay attention to other people and other voices, you know, that is a big, bold move to say, don't just listen to me, but listen to the past and the future. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. I was in a conversation with someone today at the Rio where I work and we were talking about, you know, what's happening. This is a crazy political climate and we are watching and we're watching. And it goes back to the same thing I say in the book. We need someone to understand the history, to carry it through. There's a through line that needs to go through. But there's also young people that make the movements happen. But there needs, I think there's a marrying. and We can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to see things move, because, you know, young people say, oh, you know, it was never like that. Oh, it was worse, <laughs> you know. And they got to understand that they didn't reinvent the wheel, but this is what happened. And maybe you can learn a lesson from what happened so you won't repeat it, or they can help you along the way. There's so much wisdom we can get from each other. And I think putting it on the table so people can understand successes and failures and learn lessons. 
Mm-hmm. No, I, you talk a, a, a little about John Lewis and this. So it made me think about you saying, you know, it, it's better. You know, people used to ask him, how could he, you know, we we he was here in San Francisco a few times and had a conversation. He said, you know, folks would say to him, oh, things are not good enough. And he's like, they, they're not good enough, but they're better than they were. Right. Like, let's not let's not erase the progress that we've had. And I think you're doing a good job of like celebrating the women who made, even though we're still struggling, right, that there have been people that have done this work, that have moved this work and um, and continue to do so. You trust and believe, you know, in this moment, in these moments, since people like Congressman John Lewis have passed and people like Gwen Eiffel, mm-hmm. I, I keep saying to myself, Gwen Eiffel, the iconic news person, I said, Black woman. I said, my, I said to myself, I wonder what they would say and do in this moment. And I do think about that because when you have these moments, these moments that are markers of history and time, and they were for a large part of the, the transformation of the nation, and now we're transforming without them, I wonder what they would say and how they would report or how they would handle the situation. You know, just makes you wonder. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's... Um, you talked about letter from a Birmingham jail. You talk about the uh, the fact that he was that was the voting right. That was the voting yeah. rights. You know, just months after January six, these black women dared to about uh, 10, 12 black women dared to fight for the right to vote because we're now voting without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's gutted, it's basically gone. And it's also before the United States Supreme Court. The rollback is real. With that said, these women to include Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, the head of the Congressional Black Caucus, along with Melanie Campbell and Tamika Mallory, Core Masters Berry, who was crying because she said, you know, we shouldn't have to be doing this again. She says, I was there the first time. We shouldn't have to be doing this. They're just singing gentle songs of the civil rights movement in the Senate office building. Months after January 6th, they get arrested Mm. and taken to jail. Mm. They get arrested, these black women, and taken to jail. About six of them, because it was COVID, they tried to keep it COVID friendly, The, the police officers did sitting on that metal bed with no blanket, no nothing, no pillow, toilet in the middle of the floor, open where anybody could see. And they, they said they were trying to hold it so they didn't have to go because they didn't want to do that. But they, they were saying, uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty said, you know, she thought about the letter from Birmingham jail, from the Birmingham jail. She said, that was that moment. That was a powerful statement in that moment just opposed to what happened months prior to. Mm-hmm. Tens of thousands of people were raising a ruckus, an insurrection, weren't arrested, and they're still looking for some of them. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate no one was no, I appreciated you describing that because I think it becomes too easy again to like dehumanize the stories and just be like, oh, you know, as you say, political stunts or this was just for attention. But like the reality of going through that process. And the only and the only that during January 6th, and I put this in the book, they desecrated Congressman John Lewis's memorial. Mm-hmm. But in January 6th, that picture, that iconic picture of Shirley Chisholm that is in the hallowed halls of Congress was looking down and they didn't touch it. That black woman looking at, mm-hmm. I love that picture. And they it didn't touch it. It is a beautiful picture. Yeah, they didn't touch it. I well, said, because they knew, they knew not to touch it because she was like, mm, what you doing? <laughs> you know, she yes, was looking yes. down on them. Yes. 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 Well, I want to get to some of the questions from the folks in the, the chat and remind folks to, um, put their questions in there. Uh, Again, back to this idea. Well, one is about the book cover, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, There's a question about- Jeff Manning from Philadelphia. And so the, can you talk more about the image and why you chose that artwork? Well, Jeff Manning, first of all, it was really, it, it was simple, but not simple. They said, I'm, I, I love art. I love art. Um, I have art throughout my home. And 
they said to me, what book covers do you like most? They said, go and look at your book covers. I love the 1619 Project for now, my now friend, Nicole Hannah Jones. And if you read the book, you'll understand why. Oh, we had, sure, we had a good time in Martha's Vineyard together this year. So if you read the book, you'll understand why, guys. So why I say that. Um, I said, I like Nicole Hannah Jones and the artwork of Will Smith, his book. Mm, yes. His book is beautiful. And so is hers. If you look behind the six, the word six, the letters, 16, 19 words, you see be- a beautiful blue artwork behind on her book. So they said, what do you like? I said, I like those two. So they went back and started thinking and they began, they talked to Jeff Manning in Philadelphia and Jeff, they were talking to him. Jeff, this is, he, he, we called this woman, his mother, her mother's name, Benita. And he, the problem is for us as black women, we're not the standard of beauty and we're not considered vulnerable. There is beauty here. She's getting her flowers Mm. as she's got her eyes on the prize looking forward. Mm. She's vulnerable, but yet strong. And look, red, white, and blue, she is patriotic. And the anthem, because it was Black women will save the world, but then we added an anthem because we're saying it over and over and over again. Mm. This beautiful Black woman is the symbol of beauty. Mm. We're giving her flowers and her femininity as she's looking to save her community, her Mm. family. And she's patriotic in the midst of it all. Mm. See, I tell you, feel like you just taking me to church all throughout. Like I'm just, I'm reading the sermons and I'm being converted. Thank you. That was beautiful. You're not converted. You there. You know what's going on. <laughs> you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be who you were if you didn't know what was going on. Human rights, you're fighting. That's a fight. You're standing strong. Come on, Cheryl. <laughs> look. look. Look, it's just, but as you say, the 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 superpower of sisterhood and being able to not feel um, invisible or alone. And you talk about like sometimes standing alone, you feel uh, it, it, you're more targeted than the in, the anonymity that comes from being able to be in space with each other. Um, yeah. The next question, April and Cheryl, I admire and respect you both all for your courage and consideration for others. Can you address black women working in media getting respect, sustaining, and flourishing? I'm still figuring that one out. (laughs) (laughs) Sustaining and flourishing. Um, I have worked in various organizations along the way. Um, During my White House stint, pretty much for 25 years, I've been with Black media. I hear quite a bit that black women don't get paid the money that they're supposed to. I go in knowing my worth. We have to know our worth and not be apologetic about who we are and what we bring to the table. Don't be outrageous, but know who you are, know your worth. In those rooms, we are now convening rooms. We have to Give respect, but demand respect as well. Mm. And make sure you are not, you have to constantly fight to make sure you are still on top because everyone else is on. I, I, watching the election cycle and watching some of these, the commentary and some of the pundits on, some of my friends didn't get a word in edgewise who happens to be black. We've got to ensure our wins. We can't allow other people to ensure our wins. We've got to make sure we walk in and win. And I'm going to tell you, there's a friend of mine. I didn't know she did this, but I'm so proud of her. She works for a major, major organization. If I say the name, you would know what it is. But I don't want to give it away um, because she trusted me with this. They asked her to be um, in a very high-ranking, high-level position. And they and she said to them, okay, well, tell me how a black woman in your organization will win. And they were shocked. The man went back to HR and talked. He came back with an answer. She asked them for the win, not just one up in the space. 
She mm. asked them to help her win. That is poignant. How do we win together? Mm. Sustain longevity. Sometimes you know, other communities go in asking. We have to learn to ask as well. We are beneath no one, mm. equal to all. That's, that's, that is extremely powerful. Isn't that's that true. powerful? That is that's powerful. powerful. I can I cannot I cannot say who she is, but in the company, yeah. but she blew me away with that. I was like, wow! And she's like, they have been working to help her win, and we have to go in like that. Yeah, don't just go into a job and go. Ensure your win. Mm-hmm. Ensure your win. Not only ensure your win, but make sure you know your worth. Yes, not just monetarily, but know your worth and where you stand in the company. Yeah, I'm writing all that down. I'm like, you know, the, <laughs> on top of all my other notes from the book. And, and that speaks to the, one, another question we have. What is the best piece of professional advice that you've received? And uh, if you're able to share, who was it from? Um, my late, the late, um, my late boss, the man who hired me at the White House, Jerry Lopes. He died about a week just before the White House Correspondents Association dinner. And it tears me up. He said, you know, you need to have a poker face. I don't have, I don't play poker and I'm still trying. I'm still, I don't know how to bluff. Cause look, that's why there are all those memes of me. It's like, cause it's like, I'm like, I, I got that. I need to know how to play poker better. <laughs> Well, it, it's interesting because that aligns with another question that kind of is about your, let's see, um, as someone who's covered the White House and politics for 20 years, right, there's one that's about specifically what concerns you most about the state of the country, but another mm-hmm. one about how did you maintain your co- composure when you were attacked and insulted? So one is about where do you, you know, what are you concerned about? But another tags into this idea of like, how did you hold your, even though your face may not have been... <laughs> Uh, a poker face you still were just like I, I think that that was restraint to just shake your head no it, it, that is restraint in and of itself so let me say this let me say this in the book I talk about that I was in shock um, as I walked through protecting my children trying to make sure they felt safe and felt like nothing was going on as I was getting death threats bombs except fake bombs and all this stuff I was in shock and I was walking through but I wouldn't be able to show, I wouldn't be able to show up here with you today in this moment if I'm not in therapy. I am in therapy every I have a standing appointment every Tuesday morning at 8:15 Eastern time. While y'all sleep over there, I'm in therapy. And it's just, you know, the residue of it. You know, um, in the book, the, the cover is beautiful, but the book, the back is even more beautiful. Okay. And I talk about this in the book. I was stressed out. I lost a large portion of my hair. This is my real hair. I have, I'm thankful um, that I'm able to be here today to show up to you. And the state of the country plays into what I went through. If you ask a question about an underserved community, you're attacked. If you ask a question that people may not think that is right, I think the state of this country, we need to know what we're doing. We need to have civics so we can understand the dance, the political dance amongst Democrats with Republicans and reporters with politicians. Because we have a lot of rebuilding to do. Mm. I was with Carl Rove, uh, the kingmaker for George W. Bush, in Orlando this weekend, um, we were speaking to the National Realtors Association, and he said, both parties are broken, they are. And everyone is now speaking out in the Republican Party against a candidate who wants to run. We have to see how this plays out. Mm-hmm. We are in deep repair. We have, we've gone through some of the worst growing pains. The question is, how will we rebound from that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had some very dark times and they could have been worse. Mm-hmm. But we have to figure we have to rebuild. We have to come back stronger and better. I think it's going to be worse before it gets better. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, we COVID hasn't gone. <clears throat> We're in a pandemic. 
well, not a pandemic, but the pandemic is not, but we're still in COVID. Um, people still saying, get your shots. You know, I'm on a plane, people coughing, hacking on, you know, on the plane. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize that there's still illness here and be wise about it. And it's wintertime, people are going back indoors. Mm -hmm. um, and then we are possibly facing, you know, some financial issues. I just, you know, got word that some major financial institutions are laying folks off because people are pulling out of their savings and retirement accounts to deal with the inflation, the rising costs of everything that we're dealing with on a daily basis. It's real. So we're rebuilding and we're figuring ourselves out. I thank God that we didn't go as far as we could have gone. We're rebuilding. <clears throat> And as you, you talk about that, the concerns um, and you talk about being in space with um, Carl Rove and talking about like both both sides are going to have some issues and some challenges. Uh -huh. another, another question was, what do you think are the, the biggest challenges on both sides of the aisle? What are the challenges facing the Republicans? What are the challenges facing the Democrats? Mm. how to handle what happened in the last couple of years and how to move forward. Um, how to be able to work together for the American people. It's not about party, it's not about politics, it's about people and humanity. And the reason why we're, we're going through some of these extremes and, and voting for some of the most extreme people it's because the system is broken and people feel like they're not heard. People all across the spectrum. I'm not just talking about on the Democratic side and on the Republican side. I'm talking about everyone. People who claim that they're independent, people who are Democrats and Republicans. People, feel, as I say, everyone wants to feel seen and heard. And you have people who feel like they have not been touched or thought about. That's some of the reason why we have this extremism and that's why we gotta figure this thing out. Well, and I think that that's why um, this book in so many ways is um, you talk about it as an anthem, but it also in and I love the way that you ended. It is a roadmap. Right. And in one of the questions that we had was like and I think if you get the book, April lays it out very well. But they ask, how can you like what is the most effective way to actually acknowledge and and support the un underappreciated work of black women? Yeah. Um, we have to pay attention for one to recognize the unappreciated work of everyone, but particularly black, black women, we have to pay attention. And I pray that everyone, we, black women, we celebrate, black communities celebrate everyone. We bring in everyone, but I think what we need to do is understand that as a community, we have to stick together, pull together and rise together and, and, and console together, support together. Um, and then we go out and celebrate because we have, we have to fix this. We have to fix this not pouring back into ourselves because we have so much, just so many people. I think we just need to just take a moment and breathe and, and just celebrate ourselves and then go back out and, and just, and I think the community needs to pay attention to us as well. I think everybody just needs to just, we celebrate each other, but come in and look at the black woman and say, okay, this is your moment. This is your moment. Mm -hmm. and then take it and then when the next group comes to celebrate let's celebrate them but right now we are marking this moment because if we don't mark this moment we'll lose the momentum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the the like just the taking the moment and i think you you again the book really spells this out in terms of we're so busy serving and saving that you don't get a moment to really 
um, savor, right? And to to see what's happening. So I appreciate that. Like, take a moment, pay attention, see what's happening. But for other folks to also stop asking, right? And just mm -hmm. see what's already being done. Um, another question was about your um, your first days covering the White House, right? Were you overwhelmed? How did you manage that going into this space, especially at a time when you were the only Black woman? I was overwhelmed. I wanted to leave. Uh, my mother told me, my late mother, when she was alive, she said, you cannot leave. Um, you have to wait at least two years because if you, if you leave now, people think you got fired. <laughs> that was back then, right? That was that thought back then. Now everybody's jumping the first three months. Oh, I don't like this. I'm gone. Um, yes, I hated the job because it was so much. But what I once hated, I just can't get away from. Yeah. Well, we are glad you didn't get away from it. We appreciate you in that space. We've reached the point where there's time for one last question. And the last question is, what do you enjoy the most about your job? Stories, learning about people, learning about things. And most importantly, when I find out information, I translate it back so you can understand what impacts and affects you so you can live your day and carry on. That's really the most important piece to me. Well, um, I am so grateful for so many things. First, for the opportunity to to read the book and just the, the impact that the book, I'm like going through the list of names. Thank you for listing them out in the book as yeah. well. And I, I'm teaching a class at University of San Francisco. I'm like, this is now going to be on the reading list. And yes. I just think it is a powerful, powerful book, both from a personal space, but also professionally for anyone doing any work um, that has them come across Black people, especially Black women, they need to read this book. And um, for young folks who are going to be moving forward in this work, the inspiration that lives and resides there. So thank you. Let me know when you do it with your class, because I'd love to come back and do a virtual with you. Well, I, I got all the, I got a list of things where I'm like, I need you to be in San Francisco so we can have you <laughs> like talk about this book and the book and the impact. Bring me back in the spring. I'd be glad to come. Oh, well, I will have you. So I, I want to, again, just thank you for this book, for seeing and being born to tell and not shirking on those duties. I uh, And I'm glad to know somebody else from Baltimore. I've worked with D. Watkins and uh, yes, congratulations. I love Congratulations on Wes Moore as the governor. Yes, he says he's going to have me in the state house with my book. Uh, so I'm, yes, I'm hold yeah. Yeah. all the things. Well, yeah. our thanks to April Ryan, author of Black Women Who Will Save the World, an anthem for joining us today. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of April's book at your local bookstore. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org events. I'm Cheryl Davis. Thank you and take care. <laughs>